So I'm going to speak today about is something old or something new, I suppose, and I want to thank Emma for organising the event and her colleagues. I don't know, but I'm well done for doing so, is what I'd say, because creating spaces and giving time to public events isn't always rewarded in this life, as they say, <laughs> certainly not in the neoliberal academy. So thank you for doing so. Um, I'm going to speak, I suppose, first of all, very briefly, because people don't always comment on the history of the universities. The universities are not a new phenomenon, and when we look at where they've come from, uh, there's a long history of control, you know, and that is not new. We think of the university as somehow a new space. But if you go back to the origins of university, we have the Imperial Taishu University in China in the second century, 30,000 students, <laughs> And it was Chinese literature, Confucianism, and of course, civil service education, for which China has always been famous. And Weber wrote about it indeed when, um, as a sociologist in Germany and studied it in the 19th century. And you had Abbasid's House of Wisdom in Baghdad, which was subsequently suppressed in the 13th century, but was a huge center of learning and a huge area of scholarship. So people forget that we have a history that isn't European is probably the point that I'm making because sometimes I think we forget that. And we have the monasteries of Europe, the cathedral schools the 11th, that led to the development of many European universities. And of course, they were made preserves. I do want to maintain that theme throughout because there is a relationship between kind of the way masculinity has been defined and equated as Connell has written about with dominance and the way in which the university is constituted, and in particularly the culture of the neoliberal university, which is, as was said at the very outset, so totalitarian and so controlling, and the image of masculinity as equated with dominance and control. So we have the Napoleonic concept, which of course was about direct control. There is nothing new, I'm saying, in some ways, although if we don't read history, we forget that there is nothing new about control. It's not a new phenomenon. Uh, the Humboldt University Unity of Teaching and Research, but the emphasis on individual academic freedom, but also a lot of state control. So there is control. Newman's vision, of course, was from freedom from the church, but for non-vocational humanities, primarily education, but also primarily for men. So it was men of the upper middle classes and the upper classes of society. So the universities have not been universal. That's what I'm trying to say. Let's not romanticize the past. They were far from universal. And just I took Ireland, my colleague in education, Juris Hartford, has written about it. Women were only granted entry to Trinity, for example, although it was there from the 16th century, as we know, until 1904. And the battle went on for about 50 years to allow them to be um, into the university as students. They had to go home at uh, five or six o'clock and they weren't allowed to stay on campus even when they were allowed to enter. And in the National University of Ireland, UCD admitted women in 1908. So I'm saying women's position in these male preserves where they were permitted but it was conditional and constrained. So what I'm going to talk about today is based on research, as I said, I've done with colleagues um, Bernie Grummel, who is now Manoud's Medemna in Education, and with core researchers, although I'm not going to quote much of our data because my current project, because we haven't fully analysed it yet, Maria Evanshaeva, um, Mihola Flynn and Catherine Keating, where we've done 102 interviews and collected numerous amounts of materials about appointments and procedures from the, all the universities, several institutes of technology, and we've interviewed people from people who work in senior positions, to people who are in middle management, to administrative staff uh, across, uh, and technical staff, and including people who work as manual workers, what are called often general service workers. And so this is about what we found, and I suppose what I'm, in a way, theorising from what we have found, rather than the detail of the empirics. Somebody asked about Bologna, <laughs> as it happened. I have this here, because it's not there is just new forms of control, and I think that that's very important. The European objective for education is to move it to the market. There's no question about that. 
as I said, it's, you can see the last quote there, to facilitate a more diversified <coughs> revenue stream and more collective, uh, effective collaboration with business and to uh, participate in the knowledge triangle on a global scale. So there is no question about that that is, has been part of the European project to make education a marketable commodity. Uh, it's part of the National Strategy for Higher Education. I don't need to repeat it. It's, it's called the National Strategy, but it's known as the Hunt Report. It's the same thing. Yes, at least here they have always conceived. They add, there's a little addendum. I always feel somebody editing the report puts in social and cultural at the end. And they have to add it on. You know, they have to put it in. But truth is, when you'll see down further on that it actually has very little standing in terms of its power in what is funded. And I want to go back as well because... Contrary to what a lot of people think here, they think that neoliberalism hit the university by accident. It didn't. There was an, actually when the, what was called the Rainbow Coalition, when they were in power, the Minister for Education at the time was Rory Quinn, who was a member of the Labour Party, the then workers, what were they called, Democratic Left, and, she, and Fianna Gael were in power. And they brought in a very important piece of legislation, which was the Public Service Management Act, which actually set the template for what was going to happen in higher education and the public service generally. And central to that idea, I'm quoting Neil Collins, who was professor in, at the time in business in UCC, is the idea of a public service operating according to market models or market-like models. And the idea of public the recipients of, um, and users of public services as being customers and the market citizens. And just out of curiosity in telling you this, because it's not related to education per day, but I've analysed the websites of a number of government departments. There are 2,200 references to customers on the Department of Social Protection website. There is 1,500 of them on the Revenue website. So the whole, we have a customer charter for the Department of Education. So we have taken entirely, almost without a whiff of resistance, the language of market capitalism and encoded it into our public services. That's what I'm saying. It is ubiquitous, it isn't just in higher education. And how has it been implemented, I suppose? What this project that Divna and Bernie and I did uh, was about how we saw it happening in schools in primary and secondary. And interestingly, just to say empirically what we found, of course, is there is much more resistance to it in primary and secondary schools. Why? You have far better organised teacher unions. It's as simple as that. They are far better organised. They resist, they constantly challenge it, and they do not take it as a gospel that they have to implement. Yes, they're finding it difficult to resist, but they do resist. But I said the problem is about is institutionalising it. It's not just, of course, in the public server. Every NGO, the Simon community, Sale Inner City Project, Kathleen isn't here today, anybody who wants money from anywhere has to have a strategic plan, you have to have targets, you have to have outputs, everything is measured. So it's not just happening in higher education. And as I said, we move to being service delivery operations with productivity targets. That's what we become, rather than providing for human need, uh, governed by human rights. And that is the, the problem. And I'm saying here, the whole concept behind it, neoliberalism is that the citizen's relation to state is mediated via the market. So you are a customer, so of course that means you can avail of a service provided you have money. That leads to what was people were talking about earlier, the privatisation, the internal privatisation, the creating of an internal market in the higher education system. One department competes with another, one university competes with another. What um, Tom was talking about this morning, you feel delighted because your department got it or your university and not another one. So I'm just saying it's, it's a Hobbesian concept focusing on creating privatised citizens. And this I was saying to Anna just before I start to speak, one of the saddest things I feel at the moment, when I was doing this today and I said, oh my God, I'm not doing another talk, am I again? And I feel when I go home from here, as maybe many of you feel, so isolated. You feel, you, you feel alone, you feel there is no community of resistance. And Hannah said, well, God love you, if you can't do, put up a fight, who can? And it's true. How do we put up a fight? And I think my worry myself, and I say this of myself against myself, is our resistance is too individualised. 
it is too individualised. Actually, the only thing I could say in my own defence is this year, without anyone inviting me, I was so outraged at the idea that there would be, uh, with the help of Max Green, my who's a postdoctoral scholar with me, prepared uh, a submission which subsequently did have some impact at the Joint Therapists Committee on the Future of Higher Education, where they were looking at introducing loans. And we circulated it and we did disseminate it and we gave presentation to the doll, etc. etc. So but I feel without that collectivization and without the dialogue between the university and the society and our linking with the society, we are, we're in a sense, everybody, and I know this from being sidelined many times in my life, most, no matter how good your empirical research, no matter how truthful your ideas are, you know, when you're politically inconvenient, you will be scapegoated and isolated unless you're collective. That is absolutely true. I've always think, I'm sorry to say I'm a member of SIP2, that we should all in higher education be members of one union that is united with the second level teachers union, like, I don't care which one, because they're far better organised and far more powerful. Um, so I'm saying this whole culture then is created, so we feel this sense of failure, isolation, and of course we develop the actuarial self. We're constantly monitoring our status, our promotion, our rankings or individual citations or whatever. Thankfully, I'm old enough not to have had my life sacrificed on the altar of rankings. But it is actually a, a problem for a lot of younger and newer people, not necessarily young. And what I'm saying is new su educational subjectivities are being created. We are creating new people. There's no question about that. Uh, <coughs> we are creating where economic self-interest credentials and career interests among staff are strongly promoted in that highly individualised culture. Why would you work in the public interest? Why, who, who? And this, I think, I want to draw an analogy, and those of you from Ireland will particularly appreciate this. I taught, of course, for many years here lately to start the degree, undergraduate degree in social justice, and it has with the law faculty. Lots of law students there. And I remember one day being struck by something somebody said to me, when uh, they were talking about where they were going, their Arthur Cox, or they'd been called to, somebody else was doing business and finance and, as well, and they were going to KPMG and uh, Morgan, what is Stanley or wherever. And I said, it now is just like the religious long ago. The religious orders came and they recruited the idealists and they took them and they converted them. Now multinational capital comes in, it recruits the idealists and they think they are the chosen few. And that is absolutely true. If your son or daughter gets into Arthur Cox or whatever it is, McCann Fitzgerald or whatever, the KPMG, everybody congratulates you. Like you had a vocation. <coughs> because this is the new vocationalism. This is where people are chosen. You are chosen. You're one of the chosen few. You're one of those which I, anyone who knows me knows I have an antithesis because I started my first life measuring intelligence tests in the Education Research Centre and I regard it as the greatest pseudoscience that ever hit the face of humanity. And, but you have this myth that you are the gifted. So I'm saying the university, we haven't resisted that. We haven't spoken. We haven't been loud enough. So what happens then internally is this market efficiency. It prioritises different values. So first order social moral values are reduced to second order principles, trust, integrity, care, compassion, solidarity are subsumed under control, regulation and competition. To me the biggest thing I suppose is the removal of trust. We are not trusted to do anything. I am 30 something years in this university and I find it amazing that every single day I have to get so many people if I want to get uh, two books or something they have to for e procurement, if anyone has the pleasure of ever dealing with them, three people have to sign it because we are not trusted. We are not trusted to use our grants properly because there is a new authoritarianism that says you are minions and you are in control. You are not in control of your own life. So, what I'm saying is this glorification of competition where we must, becomes the amoral becomes the necessitous. You have to do it whether you like it or not, or even if you don't do it, it will be done to you, especially if you seek another job or seek promotion. So what I'm saying is there is a new moral regulation. And I don't think that this new moral order is just a preserve of academia. I think it's much wider than that. So we're disciplined, whether we like it or not, through capitalist morality. 
uh, we emulate it, and measurement and surveillance are key facilitators of market norms because they produce education in standardised, measurable, quantified terms that ultimately can be commoditized. In fact, I gave, I remember, because I found my notes, I was looking at it, the first lecture, I remember, on this issue in 2005, and people were saying, it won't happen in Ireland. I remember thinking, why do people always think that? Why do think people think that what has happened all over the UK and America and everywhere else is not going to happen here? Of course it's going to happen here, unless we resist it. But we didn't resist it strongly enough, and it's here unless we resisted a bit more, perhaps through the unions that we have, but we do have not effectively controlled it. Because there is, you know, we're all about being measured. And I would argue it is really indifferent to issues like inequality. Performers or non-performers are a liability. I was at, you know, we've, from our studies, we have numerous cases where people talk about how they only want the students who have got more than 450 points or 500 points. They don't want people where there might be a challenge or a difficulty because it's the same with staff. Staff who are vulnerable become a liability in a measurable performing system. And as was said earlier on, ethics are subordinated to pragmatism. Why would you be concerned with equality? What's that got to do with the university anymore? And so what I'm saying is, the, for example, I find it fascinating that we have Ad Astra scholarships, you know, these scholarships for people who are already, we know perfectly well the people who get highest points to get into the university. And the same is true in the scholarship system in Trinity. The people who get higher points get entrance scholarships. They're only small there, and there are a lot of them. But here they're bigger, and there are fewer of them. The principle behind them is the very same thing. We reward the already privileged. That is exactly what we're doing. And then we allow the state to fund the disadvantaged students, or whatever they are. But we don't contest the system. We provide individualised solutions. We forget about the emancipatory role of, of education. I would say as well, to me, I suppose I'm just giving examples because I'm in UCD and we didn't study UCD, I should say, because I would have to get permission and everything to do so working here. But these are fascinating things to me. Anonymous emails. Anonymous emails now are ubiquitous. We get emails from IT communication. Who is IT communication? And what do they do? But did we resist? There's, you have no relationship with the person. The person doesn't exist. It removes responsibility and removes accountability. You have one-way emails, you know, which you really would get. Are they information, authoritarian control and regulation? I say, for example, at the end of this big long list of people who produce money for the college, it's a naming and shaming and adulation at the same time. You're one of the chosen few if you bring in money. You're one of the absent people who should be remembered that you're not on the list in the weekly email. So what I'm saying here is, and of course you've no right to reply. You get an email from central administration, but you've no right to reply. So this is fundamentally authoritarian communication. And when people say, you know, why or why do we, it is because when you communicate back, there's no one to whom you can communicate. Or if you do, nobody listens. And what are credible principles like efficiency, um, accountability, I would argue have become empty rhetorical devices, which bear little relationship to practice, bears little relationship to the principle. For example, as I said, multiple signatures to sign for. Measurement is the way of operationalizing the new morality. As Brunner said, habitual conceptualizations become normalized ways of interpreting and structuring experience. And those of you who might know the social sciences and Taylorism know about time and motion studies and measuring people and quantifying them. It has been introduced in higher education and in most workplaces uh, with standardization, quantification and surveillance. I was invited three years ago to the University of Melbourne and I found this sh shocking and, I suppose, amazing in equal measure. I was invited to one of the departments. I didn't know the person very well who was chairing the session. Out of courtesy, I went to look up their profile. The first thing I got was a graph, a graph that showed me the percentage of their publications by year. And then, you know, whether they were going up or down, their citations, I got a graph. Which showed me this is how the person is. This is their persona. Maybe they put it there themselves. I didn't have the... I uh, had the, you know, the, the audacity to ask them. But I'm saying it is, we're reducing people uh, to numbers. And, of course, numbers are very easy. The newspaper can pick up a rank. It can't maybe uh, interpret a complicated, you know, um, text. 
So they're signifiers of value and they operate, as I say here, symbolically. And they're very easy to communicate across the world. You know, we know that rank one means one in China, if it rings one in Ireland. It's the same thing. We don't need another language. And new imaginaries are reframing. So we create quantifiable workers, or whatever the type they are, and quantifiable students. But of course, we must remember, we do that, as the previous session referred to, already in schools. We do it already in schools. We start to label children right at the very beginning, classifying them, labeling them, and then marketing and packaging them. It's not like it is a new phenomenon, but it's become exacerbated and applied to ourselves, perhaps. And maybe that's why we find it so uncomfortable. And the numbers of the status of absoluteness and unassailability. They have an unwarranted truth standing that doesn't apply to narrative evaluations. And of course they appear objective, because numbers have the semblance of the power of positivism, the absolute objectivity, that what can be hierarchically ordered can be incontrovertibly judged. And, of course, as I said, it's done, they have an emotional outcome, and certainly we have found that to be probably the most significant thing, uh, among the most, and that in relation to the use of time and stress that people have as academics, but not just as academics, as administrators and, and other technical workers in the library and elsewhere in higher education, because they always feel they are being measured. They're under constant surveillance. And, as I said here, Numbers are never neutral, they're not innocent. Uh, they create a common, simplified cognitive space for judging other people. So things that are completely heterogeneously unrelated are all collated and measured the same way. So somebody becomes a package of numbers. And I'm just saying, I know because I've written a paper, a couple of papers on rankings. For example, the rankings are used, the then what has now become the world ranking system, uh, academic ranking world, whatever, world universities, formerly Shanghai Jiao Tung, it doesn't measure the humanities or social sciences at all. Not at all. Books are excluded from most of these rankings. So why would you produce a monograph? Well, maybe that's the whole idea. You don't. Certain things just don't count. They don't matter. Student experience doesn't matter. And I know people said earlier on that there's no, but there is a multi-ranking system that the rectors of the European University have been collaborating on. So the European universities are not doing maybe what the Times Higher is doing, but they are collaborating on new ranking systems. They're more multifaceted, they're more diverse, but they are happening. There's no question about it. So I, I think that what I find of so offensive about all of these things, as I do with a lot of education, which is another argument for another day, that you couldn't judge human capabilities simply on a pen and paper test. Just the HPAT to me was the ultimate insult uh, to people because I did a, because I worked in testing, I got a number of people to test it. The number of the, uh, it has a whole set in it, there's three parts to it. One set in it, which is selected now for medicine in particular, it was introduced originally to exclude women. There were too many women going into medicine. That was the motivation in 2007. And they introduced a special test. I worked with people in mathematics because I wrote a book on education and mathematics and I asked them to study the tests. And they had a section in geometry. It's geometry based. We know that women don't do as well as men in geometry in the leaving cert. I am not joking you. That is true. And if they had put in algebra, women would have done better. But they put in a test to exclude women. There is no doubt about so what I'm saying is these are such arbitrary things. How can you judge in these psychometric tests which are ubiquitous, this pseudoscience of measuring human capability in the space of a 40-minute online pen and paper test? And what I'm saying is the net effect of that is the reification of human identity and the idea that you can measure people. And of course what happens is your identity gains currency through ubiquitous uh, citations. People say that's an A student, you know, that's a B academic. And that awful word in the English language, they're weak students. What weak? Are they falling over? Sorry? <laughs> do you know what you mean? Why do you use that language? Because we have actually a eugenics view of human intelligence, which is an argument I would make in another context another day. So I'm saying that this numbering, of course, has an incredible effect in scholarship and the attitude people have to one another, because people are constantly, and this is very evident from research, psychologically measuring themselves up and down. How am I doing? 
And much of the lack of cooperation that people spoke about is not unrelated to that. People are full of fear, fear they're not doing as well, fear they're not performing as well, fearing they don't get promoted. Now, some of it is endemic to the problem of bureaucracy of all organisations. But of course, if you constantly use numbers to evaluate and constantly profile people this way, you increase the anxiety and the focus on the fabrication of the self. So PR exercises, in fact, it's well known now in research, there's gaming goes on. People actually you know, cite other authors, cite other people who are prestigious who will cite them. There is a whole gaming industry that is now known to be true in academic journals in particular. So it doesn't matter what you say, how novel you are, or new you are, but really what matters is the numbers of your citations, even if they have, you say the same thing over and over again 20 times. And it does create a quality of envy. But as I said as well, and this is very evident now, is there is academic capitalism. There are beneficiaries. Somebody asked this morning, why do people um, do this? But of course there are people who benefit. You know, there is a culture there that where people benefit. It isn't like some people, this is imposed on us, and that is probably what I'm going to speak about now. Um, are universities serving the public interest? Well, those of you who are sociologists might have known of Robert Merton, who wrote about what he called the four fundamental principles of scholarship that should guide scholarship if it was to be in the public interest. Disinterestedness, communism, which of course is, is not allowable only in our system almost, organised scepticism and universalism. I won't define them because they're there written in front of you, detachment, uh, not privatising knowledge for personal gain. My God, we have moved so much from that. Uh, organised scepticism, where all truth claims are subject to contestation and universalism, pre-established criteria consonant with observation and previously confirmed knowledge. So disinterestedness is the freedom to research new ideas. But as Sandra Harding says, if you look at science now, look at the natural sciences, where are they funded from? Okay, here they may not be funded from the military, but they are increasingly funded indirectly, if not directly, from uh, commercial interests, pharmaceutical companies, um, IT, science, etc. They are historically were isolated from commercial interests. Now, uh, most of them, via the government in some cases, directly in other cases, can, can't claim that autonomy. Their values are commercial. Let me give you an example. The other day, of three days ago, I got an email from someone in New York. He always sends me all these reports that come to his desk on inequality. This one came from Citibank. Citibank is all over it. Citibank have written it, etc. Inside, it is written, in theory anyway, and all the pictures are there, including a former professor from this university, uh, by people who are now in Oxford. But it's actually a Citibank, controls it. They name it. You can be sure it did not go out on Citibanks uh, as a report without it being under the control of what their editors would want and would not want in it. So I'm saying sometimes our control is direct, Sometimes it's not direct. Our funding, like for example in the social sciences, traditionally quantitative data was what we, we did, if you like. Most uh, geodemographic data now is far better controlled by multinational companies. We don't have control of it at all and we can't actually produce it because we don't have that kind of money. So I'm saying we have academic freedom under the 1997 legislation. We have individual academic freedom, but we do not have collective freedom. And we have the freedom now, what I say, to do business, to produce subjects and produce materials that are, as many people have said today, marketable. And let me give you an example. These are the research priorities of the Irish government. There are 14 of them, not one single one. I went through the entire report, goes through the arts. You don't even refer to the arts, humanities or social sciences. They were set out in 2012, and that's what they are. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them. Medical devices. But I love functional foods and all. Great. I'm not saying there's anything. They're important. Smart cities or grids. I don't like the word smart for a variety of reasons. Marine renewable energy. I'm not saying they're not desirable. But all I'm saying, there is no priority for the arts, humanities and social sciences. So how can we say we're operating in a disinterested way? And... Just last, as you know, 
The UK government has cut all undergraduate funding from arts, humanities and social science subjects since the late 2000s. The French university has cut funding for post and sociology departments in 2015-16. And critical thought and critical disciplines, and let's face it, dissent happened in disability studies, ethnic and racial studies, uh, in here in equality studies, and in many women's studies particularly, and most of them have been reduced from department programmes. They have been put back in their box. Because there is a new discipline regimes are in power. And these were contesting. They were sites of contestation. Sites, cultural studies in Birmingham is a very good example of somewhere that was just wiped off the map. Not alone did they wipe it off the map, they closed the sociology department. Now they opened it again. Well, I don't know. But I'm only saying... Without those disciplines, I think it is very students often will lack the intellectual tools of dissent because the nature of teaching in a lot of other areas, although people don't admit it, is that it is highly technical and professionally led. It is not about critical thinking, and maybe it should be, but it isn't the case. And I'll give the example. How we have a total apartheid system of health, health provision in this country. We have a private system, some of it now being run for profit by the for insurance companies, others not, where, you know, 1.2 million people are in VHI or health, private health care. Do you ever hear a major university professor critique the apartheid of the health system? Never. Do you ever hear them critique uh, the fact that every GP in this country is required, whether they like it or not, to run their operation as a business? No. So where is our disinterestedness? How detached are we, if that is the case? And that's not a product of neoliberalism. I suppose that's what I'm saying. It isn't. And the communism of scholarship. We have the rise of stars. Oh my God, we have the rise of stars. Um, I would say, are we complicit in this ourselves, you know? You know, as I often say to students when I was teaching, when, when you dissent, you will be peripheralized. Don't think that people in power are going to reward you and say you're wonderful for being a dissenter. They're not. That's not how power works. But we have this culture of the stardom, and they become a professional elite where you can move around from country to country, you can, you know, get your leave, you, you can become a star, and you can maybe sometimes bring in money even better. But we're overwhelmingly the people who do that. Our stars are overwhelmingly white, western and male. And disproportionately people who can just move without any uh, commitments. So as Giroud, uh, quoting Stuart Hall, said, we didn't, they didn't send out the secret police to transform us into an entrepreneurial sector. We did it by ourselves, but through the ethical managerialism, because we didn't resist. Maybe in an organised way. I'm not saying people did individually. I think that is definitively true. I'll just give you this as an example. Just one example from our interviews. This is with a lecturer in science in one of the universities. And he's talking about his patents and how he has businesses. And he's quite upfront. We have a portfolio of patents now. We did commercialise one company. We're looking at doing another. We have spin-outs. Uh, and the Ronnie, these are our pseudonyms, obviously. Uh, and the students who's now lecture here, James, are all men. We tend to meet up in the mornings. It's a kind of breastfed club. And he goes on about how they have set up a business while they are academics. And the university approves of it. And to my absolute disbelief, I never hear anybody telling us how much money the universities get from these patents, all of whom from made by products made by people funded in the public system paid for their salaries in the public system, who are then allowed completely and without responsibility to privatise for profit products made out of public money. But that is the system, and that is what's allowable. And organised cesticism, well, we have the rise of the academic proprietor. I have all those figures from other countries. Research staff are 90 plus percent contract workers. And in fact, I would argue that the whole new system whereby we have all these temporary contract workers, the, everyone's celebrating Science Foundation Ireland grants, Irish, Irish Research Council grants, great. But most, for many people, it's a life of precarious labour and uncertainty. So I'm just saying, and women are especially vulnerable, we know from other countries, but unfortunately here we haven't got data on them because this is the 
cost report that was produced there last year on a precarious work in the academic sector in Ireland and 45% of all left train staff are temporary and part-time. The new NUI is particularly bad, I have to say that, because it's, you see, I'm not saying that because it's UCD or UCC but, or Trinity, but it's just saying that the figures are skewed by the fact that they were particularly problematic in some places rather than others. So I'm just saying, uh, uh, Lena Courton, um, uh, uh, what you call O'Keefe, I can't remember her first name, it's going out of my head, um, works in Cork now. They have done uh, quite a bit talking about this whole rise of precarious labour. I definitely think that is a threat to uh, uh, speaking out. Because when people are temporary especially, it is very difficult to be a sceptic, at least to be a sceptic in public. Yes, you may be lucky enough to find a, a sponsor among the elite who will give you a job, but if you're an organised sceptic outside, I think especially within the academy and disrupting it, it's a good way of keeping you under control. You remain a servant and then subservient to those who have permanent posts. Are we universal? Hmm, I don't know how universal the universities have ever been. It is our intellectual knowledge privileges the, uh, epistemically the West and the North in this part of the world. Um, if you, I often used to get students when the days when we had textbooks. No one has a textbook anymore now, hardly, apart from the fact they're so expensive. I mean, even books. Um, but I used to get them to open the page and see where their book was published. What? Capital city. You can be sure it was most likely, maybe if it's certain disciplines it would be different, it would be London, it would be Amsterdam, it would be New York. It is in the big global capital estates. The publishing industries are in control. And Western, white, male dominated ideas of modernity, post modernity growth, underpin most of our thinking. I don't know if people are familiar with Walter Minolo, who is from Argentina. And as he said, I put in gender and class myself. He didn't have it in, but I'm putting it in. The geopolitics of knowledge goes hand in hand with the geopolitics of knowing. It is the racially marked, I would say, and gendered and class body in a geopolitical space that feels the urge to get the call to speak. Who has the authority to speak? Whoever had the authority to speak. Contrary, I take the point that uh, <coughs> was made this morning. Of course, as academics, we know more about our subject than other people. But experiential knowledge, especially in the field of social justice and other fields, is a real way of knowing the world. And I think, certainly, if we talk about groups or communities, other ethnic minorities or whatever, if we speak about people and for them, we take away their voice and we colonise them another time. That is what we do. We colonise their life world. Kathleen O'Neill, who's left now, I wrote an article about this 23 years ago. We, 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 she's a working class community activist about how people colonise your life world. And then they claim to know you and to cite you and your interesting comment. And that becomes part of their academic capital. So I think there are very real ethical questions about that and where we stand ourselves and who has the authority to speak. Are we, who is the enunciator and the enunciated? Who decides what deserves to be named? Are they old problems or are they new problems? I'm not so sure. What I'm saying here is that knowledge is produced sometimes it moves beyond bodies and localities. It isn't. It's a class to globalise division of labour. Experts write theory from the northern world, the western world, and natives write about local problems. And that is very interesting. Nobody writes about it, certainly in the social sciences, about the hegemonic influence. They're always writing now. Raymond Connell has written out it. Alatus has written about it from different perspectives. Minola is writing about it from South America. That there is this hegemony of the west. That, and I suppose Said has written about it many years ago. But if you write in Irish or Bengali or whatever, you're not going to become a universal scholar because nobody will read you. Because we have the hegemony now almost of the English language. And then we have those with people, as was rightly said this morning, the people who are not here, the people who can't speak. And where can we create a space so the people who have a lot to say but haven't the vocabulary or the time, and certainly the space to do it, are given a voice to challenge our way of seeing the world, to challenge our discourses. That, I think, is a very big question. 
of the university. And who benefits? Well, I think a lot of people benefit and always have benefited. Exclusions always benefit some people. Yes, we have the new managerial elite. And of course, there's not just their salaries, there is the power that comes with being part of that. And unlike schools, I suppose, that is where it's such a problematic issue because the universities, the majority of staff in the universities are not academics. I'm not saying that academics are radical, let me just tell you that now in case I think, I think you think, I think that's the problem, I don't think so. But you know, Gramsci spoke about traditional and organic intellectuals. I think the same irony, and to me the ultimate contradiction, especially of this country, is we have had and still have most of us who are, have jobs full time have permanent status. It is virtually impossible to fire you unless you're grossly incompetent. And do we speak? That's the question. We don't speak. We don't even speak at academic council, where we have an audience to speak. And when you do speak in dissent, you are isolated as a crank. Because maybe that is where the hegemony of neoliberalism and promotion and stardom and your next career move or whatever it is has taken over. So I'm saying what has happened, in my view, is that the new managerial system, substantial rationality, which we referred to this morning based on values, has been superseded by instrumental rationality that Weber spoke of. It's anything that is measurable in output and input terms simply doesn't count. There's a refusal to engage. I mean, I know this because I've written many, many emails, letters, etc., uh, seeking response, criticizing everything, no reply. There is an incredible totalitarianism in humanitarianism. And if you resist, it's, um, I think what happens is there is no reply because people don't feel they need to resist. In a completely centralized control regime, people, our people don't feel they have to reply. Uh, and I'm, one moral code applies, that the moral code is the market. I do believe we can break it, by the way. I do believe in resistance. And I think that the fact that the students are out the other day fighting over fees, that we've put out information, research, etc., and that people have mobilised, I think that is to their credit. I think we can resist, uh, that we don't have, as bad as things are here, that they won't be as bad as they are elsewhere, to put it at its weakest, I suppose. But I, I want to speak, and lastly on this point, I suppose, is... I also think at a very deep level, I suppose I've written a book on effective equality, love, care and injustice, again with colleagues, a um, number of colleagues, uh, including John Baker and a uh, number of other people. But I did a lot of the empirical research for this book with other people, and so I want to warn that as well. But one of the points that I say is the concept of the person that underpins our thinking, it comes from liberalism, not just from neoliberalism, the rational view of the person person is homo sapiens, not homo sentience. And of course, homo sapiens has become homo economicus under neoliberalism. And they have become the economically productive citizen. But the person, we are emotional beings. We are relational beings. I suppose I'm very much influenced by new writing in South America in particular about the importance of the relationality of the person. Um, that we are not autonomous subjects. The denial of our dependencies and interdependencies, socially, economically, environmentally, politically and culturally. And in a sense, the academy hasn't really addressed those issues. And I'm only speaking to do, I've written a paper and published it a long time ago on this uh, in relation to the knowledge that we produce in higher education. But I'll just speak about what I suppose is true and what certainly we found most in our most recent study is this carelessness. Because performativity in a market system at the level that is required for academic success requires a carefree life. It requires you not even to have a cat or a dog because you really can't bring them to a lot of other countries. Never mind have a partner or people who might actually be attached to wherever you would like to be. And there is invisible care work that goes on for everyone throughout life. Care of ourselves, care of our partners, children, whoever, elderly parents, elderly aunts and uncles. And of course, uh, your friends. But it assumes that there is a prioritization of the product and the success of the cell. So we are idealized 24 7 workers. And I see it particularly, I suppose, in postdoctoral fellowships at the European level. The absolute assumption that somebody can just pick up roots this year, three years there, three years here, three years somewhere else. 
no attachments, no affiliations, no problem, just bring your children to another country, no problem. The Caroline Fellowships this year, which are utterly discriminatory from the IRC, and I know a number of my postdocs have written an objection to them, because they are actually preclude people who have children from actually applying indirectly, because you cannot move country for a year and come back in for a year if you have care responsibilities. It doesn't have to be children. It could be somebody elderly you have to look after. There is an assumption you are a monastic worker still, working in your little cell, writing your manuscripts on your own, with nobody to worry about. And we have, of course, then to produce this incessant supply of deliverables. Uh, because, and that often involves self-exploitation, where people overwork, they work late at night. Mm -hmm. Certainly we have found that most people work at night time and they work at weekends. And that has become a normalised practice. And I mean, that has a very high price, ultimately. Because somebody has to do, if there is dependency work, somebody else has to do it. That's what I said at the beginning. The assumption is that there's some kind of social wife around who will do that dependency work. And I'm saying that our current lacks time. We don't give people time. That time has come up again. I haven't fully, we haven't fully analysed it. But time has come up as an enormous resource issue for people. Time to be. Time to have relationships. Time not to feel guilty every time you are not working. So I'm saying the academic freedom we have is a constrained freedom in a market-led system, but I don't know to what extent some of it is new and some of it is old. I suppose that is my argument. Due to colonial epistemology and science, I don't think that's new. I don't think the class bias and gender biases of our knowledge, and who we define as you know, legitimate scholars to study, etc., is accidental. It's, it is, reflects a long cultural history of universities. Disinterestedness, yes, it has certainly become much more problematic with neoliberalism because it's more blatantly business-led. Communism or scholarship, it is rewarded now in a way I always think that academic life is a very selfish life. It even encourages to be extremely self-centred, the way you're rewarded. It does. Not to omit your co-authors. Like, you should never cease to amaze me, because in the social sciences often, you know, you have big data sets and lots of material that you work with other people on. And these books up here, and I say, they were research assistants on that. I thought, weren't there postdocs or PhD students? No one's name appears. It's only the star. As if they produced it all on their own. That is a huge ethical question and a huge exploitation of what I would call servant labour, which probably has been exacerbated, but maybe isn't new. And, of course, in a time of precarious work, and especially as so many researchers particularly, I think the money that has been siphoned off, as you know, we've only about 60% of what we had in 2008 in higher education sector, where I can give you the data, I have it somewhere else. But what we have is a huge increase in research grants to fund PhD students and postdocs to do the work at a far lower rate. That's what's happening. We have new forms of slave labour, as I said. I'm not saying they're slaves in a very literal sense, but I'm saying they become dependent workers for a very long time with high levels of insecurity. They can't go on with their lives. The same way that people are constantly moved around the world, as if, of course, it's a virtue. We all love to move, but we don't always want to move at the times that we're told that we have to move. I remember a science faculty here, I was on a board one time, uh, an overview of an assessment system, they told me that three students had to have three postdocs abroad, i.e. that's nine years, the time that women often were having children. What are they supposed to do? Just put everything on hold until the university decides they have three postdocs. So what I'm saying is I think there is a callousation and precariousness of work, which is related to neoliberalism, and definitely I think it, but it's some new aspects of it are not new. So that's what I'm saying. I feel, I suppose, there's a danger of education becoming an amoral practice unless we resist and fight for it. So the m value of education is to just reduce to some kind of technical reorganisation. When you object to these stupid outputs and inputs and labels and whatever, you're told that really it's just a technical change. Of course, it's not a, just a change in nomenclature. It's a change in the whole way we think about students and we think about how we teach. And I think the region, we need to think maybe much more fundamentally, as Minola talks about, start from the principle that the regeneration of life shall prevail over primacy of the production and reproduction of goods at the cost of life. So I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you.